Well, welcome everybody. And thank you, Judy, for your introduction. Um, some of those things are not current. She, <laughs> I don't no longer have the motorcycles. And I, I did get my pilot's license, but it was um, like 40 years ago. So you don't wanna go up with me. <laughs> um, so I wanna thank you, Judy, for, for the invitation to, to be here also. Because of my work with the World Affairs Council, I know several of you out in the audience, and some of you have spent some time at the Sea Ranch. So my husband and I have had a place at the Sea Ranch for 23 years. It's really the only consistent thing in our lives, actually. Um, and we have moved all over the place, all over the US, um, twice to Texas, but that's another story. I've spent half my working career with large corporations and the last half with startup companies. I can't imagine going the other way and ending up in a large company. Once you've sampled the life of an entrepreneur, it's very difficult to go back to a more traditional setting. Um, think of a corporate experience of a balanced with being balanced with no real highs and lows versus a startup company which has major highs and lows. So um, some people just prefer um, the more balanced track and that's just fine. This morning I'll talk about three topics. Um, the first will cover entrepreneurship, what it is exactly, then I'll share my perspective on innovation, and I'll end up with giving you a look at regional uh, startup ventures that are now seeking funding. So how many of you out there consider yourselves an entrepreneur or know somebody who is, um, like sitting next to you? <laughs> um, if you are curious about a lot of things and don't mind change, you may be one and don't even realize it. We all have ideas and we all are storytellers with some of you turning almost every personal experience into a captivating, sometimes humorous story. Being able to tell a compelling story about your startup is, is sent an essential skill in, um, in actually in front of an investor, being able to get them interested in what you've done. It really can make or break you from moving forward. So storytelling is critical in entrepreneurship. We all get excited about learning new things. You might get excited about a music concert coming up but the person next to you might be excited about finding a hike, a new hike that's dog friendly. It all depends. Here's an example from Scotland. Nicola Sturgeon recently announced on social media that she had passed her driving test at age 53. Nicola was the first former minister um, of Ireland, of Scotland, excuse me, Scotland for eight years. She served there. Anyway, she posted a photograph of herself and her driving instructor on Instagram a couple of months ago. So this is a quote from her. I couldn't have done it without my brilliant instructor. The whole experience has taken me well out of any notion of a comfort zone, but hopefully proves that it's never too late in life to do something new, unquote. So learning to drive is not something, it's not probably a new adventure for you out there, but learning a new card game or a new dance move um, might be, you know, something that you, you think about what you do, something new, maybe once a month or something. Um, so being curious is an essential component of what I'm talking about this morning. So let's take a closer look at entrepreneurship, innovation, and creativity. <laughs> oh, we're going to the dark side, so, okay. Um, so entrepreneurship and innovation. I, I use this, this um, 
statue. It's a huge statue up in Seattle in front of their pop culture center of an eraser. And being able to start over in entrepreneurship is critical. So you're often erasing things, starting over. So I like that graphic. Um, so what is an entrepreneur? It's simply a person who has an idea and works to create a product or service that people will buy um, and actually use. So being able to know that somebody will actually pay for your product or service is different than having it out there and just wishing somebody would come by, buy it. So there's many types of entrepreneurs. There's solopreneurs, somebody who always is by themselves, never really gets involved with anybody else. There's serial entrepreneurs. There are some people out there who have done eight and nine startups from scratch. So we call this serial, um, not killers, entrepreneurs. And lifestyle entrepreneurs, sometimes we call those digital nomads, which you in this day and age, you can be anywhere and start a company. Um, and But think of this surf um, board shop in Santa Cruz, the guy or woman who has that, that's sort of a lifestyle entrepreneur. Um, entrepreneurship, though, as something that you learn or can go to school about started in 1996 at Babson College in Wellesley, Massachusetts. Um, and the, the students actually had to uh, start a business. Um, and <laughs> I have this little shot of a new way to gift wine bottles, but can anyone see what's wrong with that one? Well, it covers up the label. So it's not so good. So that would that and there's an instance you have to start over. But anyway, they could start any kind of business they wanted. Um, but they had to think about just where am I now? Um, where am I gonna go and how am I gonna get there? And now there's two hundred thousand students taking entrepreneurship courses across the US and two thousand colleges. So it's really um sort of started blossoming back in the early 90s. So why the explosion? Well, for one thing, there's the cloud. Um, the cloud enables you to have software out there that you don't have to have big machines for servers and all that. So, you know, you can just rent space. You can rent space from Amazon, from Microsoft, et cetera. So it's much, le much less expensive to start a company that's you know has software involved. Um, website development. Some of you made your own websites, I'm sure. Um, it's pretty easy to do. If you need something really fancy, maybe you'd have to have a consultant, but you can really do it yourself. Social media. Well, we all know what's happened there, and it's very easy to get the awareness built up for your startup. And it's not that expensive to advertise on Facebook. Um, and Google. 3D printing is another uh, process that has enabled um, people to have a prototype without going the expensive route of having it built by a couple of engineers and all that. You can actually have it, you know, copy it and print it out. And, um, and last but not least, Shopify. How many of you are familiar with Shopify? Oh, so Shopify is a platform that you can um, just sell. You, if you have a product, um, Shopify provides the platform to sell it online, the payment system and all that. And it's really simple to use. Um, I have a couple of my students that, that have said, oh, it's so easy. I'm going, well, that's good. Um, the startup explosion, you know, on, on TV, started way back in Japan, 2001. You can see the first show on startup. And then the spinoff from that was in England. And then we moved, and then it went to Canada. And then we have uh, the Shark Tank in the US, 2009. But they all had created a false belief that you, that you really need outside funding to get your startup going. 
my advice to startups is not to go that route if you don't have to, because you lose a little bit of equity in your company and it just complicates things. So I say try to just get enough revenue going that you can keep going, expand a little bit, but maybe avoid the, um, the funding route. But we'll talk more about that later. So for starters, um, you don't need venture capital. You don't need a university degree, for sure. Um, you don't need a unique personality. <laughs> you don't have to be crazy to do a startup. Um, and you don't need an interest in business. There are many entrepreneurs in the nonprofit world doing fascinating things with new ideas. Um, and you don't need a detailed business plan. Here's my business plan that I go use, and it's so simple. Look at that. Nine blocks. Um, let's see. Oh, I have to point this here. This is the, uh, the value proposition. You know, just what are you doing? You know, what's your product or service? This is the customer segment. And then the other spots are, you know, just putting in what's the relationship you want to have with your customers. How are you going to reach your customers? Um, and then on, on this side, on the key resources, um, you know, what are you going to need? Very simple. How much is it going to cost? And oh, what's your revenue stream? So we, I call that a business model canvas. And that's, that's all you need. So what it does require for entrepreneurship is to be curious. We talked about that a little earlier. A positive attitude. It's so critical. And teamwork and of course, no whining, you know. So, um, in entrepreneurship, it's, it's not a set of content, you know, it's nothing like that. It's not a discipline. It, it's really a mindset. It's kind of where your mind is. Um, and it's an exercise in critical thinking. You're gonna have to do some analysis. You're gonna have to go out there and do some market research. So all that happens, but this is what it looks like. So say you're down here, this is the little egg is your startup and it's you down just beginning, okay? And you're gonna go up and you've got an idea, you've talked to a couple friends and you're going up and uh-oh, something happens. Like you, it's difficult to build your prototype. So you have to go down a little bit, a little regression, but you're still sort of moving forward. You get down here and then, oh, something else happened. You got some money. Somebody, somebody gave you some funding, so oop, you go back up. Something else happens again. You have a family emergency, sets you back a little bit. So that's, that's really what the process looks like. That's what I meant about the highs and the lows. And this is another look at it, sort of what really happens out there. It's not, it's not an easy, smooth road. So it's not management. Um, it's just a search process and <clears throat> requires discovery skills, which I'll go over in a minute. But so guess what this is, any of you out there? That is a garage out at the Sea Ranch and it's a winemaking operation. So there is someone out there who has been making wine for about seven years. They, they buy the grapes, they bottle it, they put the label on it and everything. So it's just really a small business. However, they're not allowed to sell it. You need a whole nother license for that. But that's an example of entrepreneurship out there. So the discovery skills are something that, you know, you just sort of, as you go along, you need to be constantly asking questions. You know, if you have an idea and you've got something that you want to think will, will be able to scale or, or become bigger, you've got to go to people and ask. And the thing is, is asking why. Why do you like this? Or why don't you like it? And then when they answer, ask why again, why this? And so there's like five whys that you need to go through. So you're always asking. Then you adapt and you experiment. Um, creative and critical thinking. I'll talk more about creativity later. 
communication and teamwork critical. Um, your communication skills are so important, both orally and written communications. So I teach <clears throat> innovation at the junior college and I do a lot of work on just written skills because first impressions count. And if you send out an email blast with a mistake in it, guess what? Your credibility shakes, gets shaky. So, and communication to, and, and then focus. No multitasking. We all know what happens when you multitask. You do a lot of things, not so good. So I'm always talking about when I advise startups that you've got to have time to really focus. So entrepreneurship means so much to communities. Um, it can improve standards of living. In Africa, there are villages that have entrepreneurs that are helping save water, conserve water, helping with um, solar, you know, when there's no electricity in the villages. And it's just amazing the innovations out there. Of course, it adds jobs and it sparks innovation. So here's, here's what, you, what we look like in Sonoma County. These are the number of small businesses and the, um, the small business, the SBC uh, government categorizes small businesses and it varies per category. So, you know, some, if it's retail, it could be, you know, a, a minimum of, of 100 people or something like that. But anyway, it just gives you an idea. So an entrepreneurial mindset um, is really important. And I think we all know kind of what a mindset is. Got it up there. Beliefs, assumptions, thought processes that determine behavior, that really um, affect your behavior. Um, so the, it allows you to see opportunities. Curiosity and awareness is critical. You've got to be kind of aware of what's going on around you. Um, and this is the core belief. This is my core belief. Um, it is our responsibility to leverage our interests and skills, basically to be useful to others. I don't really get involved with startups that I think are frivolous or are not going to really make a difference um, to help somebody. So I have kind of a, a standard out there of being useful. And this is a sweet spot for the mindset. Um, and yeah, this is a cocktail napkin. <laughs> I think I think I used a wine glass to do the circles. So, but here's the um, here's the interest, the interest, and you've got your abilities, needs of others. Okay, so critical. And in the middle, when they all come together, you've got kind of your entrepreneurship really moving ahead. So the habits of successful entrepreneurs, and this is um, a study that's been done. There's an entrepreneurship learning institute that is amazing. Um, it's mainly located in Ohio and Minneapolis, in, in um, Minneapolis and Mentor, Ohio. But um, they go out with surveys and, and get entrepreneurs to talk about themselves. So these are, these are the habits. Um, again, uh, being able to observe and scrutinize processes, they are good at interviewing. <clears throat> One of the most important things is to go out and again, ask people, what do you think? What do you think about my idea or my nonprofit that I'm working on? Um, and I teach interviewing skills in my class, my innovation class. Good at networking, you got to get out there and go to a lot of different things, um, you know, that kind of are related, and some are not related to what you're doing. I like to bring in really different things, and then last but not least, good at storytelling. So, but wait, let's talk about innovation. So we just kind of covered entrepreneurship in a broad way. Um, the, the term innovation um, has been kind of overused, in fact, in the last few years. I just saw a sign the other day that said innovative dry cleaning service. I'm going, well, I don't know, I don't know what, what's going on in there. Um, th in fact, 
10 years ago, if you did a search on Amazon for books on innovation, 41,000 books on innovation. Now, some of them were self-published, <laughs> you know, but still. Here's the definition I like, significant positive change. But what kind of change? Um, there's, you know, you have a new product, a new service, a new way of doing things, and actually a new way of thinking. One quick example, using the Eiffel Tower in, back in 1888, actually they started building it in 87, Gustav Eiffel was one of the engineers and Bob, the chief engineer. When they started building the Eiffel Tower, and it was supposed to be ready for the uh, World's Fair in Paris in 1989. And um, it just, it was just hard to get people it, behind it. For one thing, it was made of wrought iron, which was the first time wrought iron had been used back then. And so if you can imagine when they were building it, it was sort of half finished, you know, it's got like two things going on. People hated it. And they thought it's gonna ruin Paris. Um, it just was a monstrosity. And they lost their funding temporarily, but they kind of worked through it and you know got some of the money back and it actually was completed for the World's Fair. But that's an example of people just not accepting change. No way. And then look what it's become today. So innovation is squiggly. So I, it's something that just, it, it, you know, is a member of the past is like this. Um, and this is another definition I like. It's the result of willful and serendipitous interconnections between the little ahas. Like, whoa, hadn't thought of that. Legacy businesses and institutions do not take quantum leaps. Taxi drivers didn't invent Uber for, <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Hilton had no part in Airbnb and Wells Fargo had no part in PayPal or Bitcoin. And there's what we call an innovator's dilemma. And this is big corporations all have um, experts, many experts in them in different areas. And what happens is the experts can inhibit innovation because it challenges their way of doing things. It could challenge their jobs. So you, you know, you're gonna have to usually bring in somebody from the outside. One of the design firms that is really famous, some of you may be familiar with it, called IDEO. It's um, in Palo Alto. They do a lot of joint things with Stanford, but um, it's, uh, it's a, an organization that can come in and just rattle your cage a little bit and just have new way of thinking. And so IDEO, I'll give you an example, went to the military and the army um, in using metaphors, just trying to think in a different direction, get your brain going with different combinations. And so they, the army brought in IDEO many years ago and IDEO came in and just put up a lot of paintings, mainly of Picasso. They used Picasso and other paintings and they sort of, you know, talked about them and all these paintings. And guess what it, guess what it turned into for them? Camouflage. That's how camouflage started. You know, think of Picasso and all that. So you can really get some different things going. Um, another example is, um, it, huge transportation company in Japan brought in an outside firm to look at design of the train. And this firm, design firm used uh, nature and you know they settled on the bird beak and a high speed train. So it kind of looks like a bird beak. So innovation is a, an ingredient of entrepreneurship, just to kind of do the step through this. And curiosity, curious is a vital ingredient of innovation. So you need all these things. Um, so curiosity and keen awareness are essential to developing the, the mindset. And um, I use this little guy. This is, you know, being aware. Look up, 
instead of down when you walk around. It's amazing um, when you think about just, I don't mean you have to have your head on a swivel, but it, it, you have to be cognizant of sort of absorbing new things. Um, creativity is part of the innovation process. Um, creativity is not something you think about. It's something you do and you jot it down if you have an idea. Scott Bergen is one of my favorite in, um, authors of in, books on innovation. He's a great speaker. His videos are really fun to watch. Anyway, his book, The Dance of the Possible, is one of the, it's so fun to read. Um, probably the most honest, completely irreverent guide to creativity. I guarantee it'll make you chuckle. Um, so keep a journal, jot down ideas when they come up, and creativity is an endless resource. And um, it's as natural as breathing. And when you think about, think about losing your keys, okay? We've all done that. Well, your brain goes into this kind of overdrive, like, oh, okay, I always put the keys in the basket, go to the basket, they're not there. Whoop, look, look around, look behind the basket, you go into the closet, you're checking all your pockets, and you are thinking about most of the day about where these keys are. Your brain is just going idea after idea after idea. So it's natural. Um, some people harness in a different way, but I like the losing key example. So I want to talk briefly about the innovation engine. This is a concept um, from Dr. Tina Selig, who teaches at, at Stanford. In the, in the engineering department, she teaches innovation. And she has come up with an innovation engine, which is inside and outside things. So I'm going to show you, oops, sorry. This is, this is the inside attitude, imagination, and knowledge, and the outside or culture, habitat, and resources. So let me get these. OK. So on the inside, these are things you control, okay? It's all in you, and that is your knowledge, okay? We all have different levels of knowledge. Um, imagination is kind of the catalyst um, for transformation of knowledge into new ideas. Um, a quick example is a guy, this is in San Francisco, kind of using imagination. His name was Fred Warner, and he was commuting uh, from San Francisco to an outside place. And he went by and saw the, that the rental bike uh, stand kind of shop was closed, and it was raining. So, of course, it's going to be closed. Who's going to rent a bike in the rain, right? So he went and started thinking, using his imagination, and came up with a company called Climate Control, which sells weather insurance. It's been very successful So, to small businesses like that. So it's just an idea. Um, attitude is really the spark that sets everything in motion. So the outside are resources, um, all the assets in your community. Think about, think about Oakmont. You have so many resources here constantly gives you the ability to learn new things. Um, habitats is your local environment. We're in one right now. <laughs> um, and that affects, that affects your imagination. And last but not the culture. Um, we all have different cultures that we're involved with. There's a culture out here at Oakmont. There's a culture sort of in, in Healdsburg. There's a culture in Katati. Think about it. Just collective beliefs and values. Um, so this is what I wanna emphasize is these all influence each other. They're all interconnected. But if you look at resources on the outside and knowledge here, you see they're parallel. So they influence each other. So <clears throat> the more knowledge you have, the more you can find resources. And the more resources that are out there, the more knowledge you have. 
to back and forth and back and forth. Same with imagination and habitat. If you are in a habitat that really is open and free and it makes you kind of come up with ideas, fuels your imagination, yet your imagination can change your habitat, have new ideas for better habitat. Culture and attitude, same thing. Attitude is kind of in how individuals think about things and that produces the culture. And the culture can affect though back into the attitudes. So it just kind of gives you a way of looking and, and innovation can start anywhere, anywhere on here. But I like, it's kind of fun to think about all the, all the ways it interconnects. So quick example, um, in Thailand, there's a woman, I'll call her Lek, who lives in Northern Thailand. This is back in the early nineties. There were only 500 elephants left in Thailand. And her family had an elephant um, as who did some work for them and all that. But there was so much abuse. And the little girl, you know, she, she was in her early teens, um, noticed the abuse both in circuses and in work environments. Um, and she established the Elephant Nature Park in the 1990s. It, that, it's famous now. National Geographic has come in and, and done a... Um, a documentary on it and just I encourage you to go go see it but her attitude was to save the save the elephants kind of became a sandbox for imagination she had to have ideas to build this nature park and to get people involved in money um and so it led her to create the habitat then visitors came okay absorbed all that was going on in the nature park and then their attitudes changed about elephants and there were less abuse in Thailand because of what she did. So it's a phenomenal story. So here's some books, um, just briefly, I just wanna leave you with uh, some ideas. And, and Judy, I don't know if um, you make this slides available to, oh, okay. So you can um, either take a photo of this. These are my favorite books and um, the How Design Makes the World, again, Scott Bergen. I recommend you go to his website, scottbergen.com, check him out. Ingenious by Tina Selig is all about the innovation engine. Really a, a, a fun read. She's, she's an amazing teacher. Uh, Lean Impact, here's the nonprofit. Here's a book on taking the lean startup concept, which is, uh, originated by Eric Rice many years ago out of Stanford again. And um, it's the lean uh, startup is just doing something just a little bit, <laughs> testing it out. You've got to test it. And if you have to make adjustments, you do it early on. So it's kind of a, a way of not going too far until you interview, go out and see if somebody likes this. Well, the lean impact um, Ann Mae Chang did a book, took it into nonprofits, and it's a fascinating book. And the foreword is written by Eric Rice. So, you know, you get, you can learn all about the lean startup by um, doing that book. Start with why. Simon Sinek is probably one of my favorite. Um, oh, he's a great author. He wrote the book, Start With Why, all about the passion, what you have to have when you, you know, get your idea out there. Um, and he, but he has a great podcast, Simon Sinek. It's called A Bit of Optimism. He's a great interviewer. I highly recommend it. Same with Adam Grant. Adam Grant is a social psychologist. Um, his podcast um, is all about kind of the work environment and you know what's happening out there with ideas. Both these podcasts, Adam Grant or Simon Sinek, uh, highly recommend them. Okay, so moving right along. Oh, and where good ideas come from, Stephen Johnson. Stephen Johnson lives in Marin, fantastic writer, um, great book for going back into the history of how something happens. So I'm gonna switch here um, a little bit and talk about 
um, nurturing innovations and talk about um, an angel group. There's angel investors, there's venture capital investors, and angel investors are one of the first ones that come into a startup. And so <clears throat> we have uh, an angel group here called North Bay Angels. <clears throat> I've been with them for about seven years and I'm on the screening committee. So I see dozens of, of startups um, each month and we put them through kind of a process and then inevitably if they pass all that, they present to our members. Um, these are some of the areas, you know, here in Sonoma County where startups are percolating out there. Um, but in looking at startups, what we want to avoid are inflated valuations. If somebody comes in and says, well, my startup is worth $10 million. And we're going, well, <laughs> you know, it's only been around for six months and I don't think so. Um, <laughs> so it's sort of getting that valuation re re in a reasonable range. Um, and, you know, we try to avoid impractical ideas, something we need something that really is going to work. And small markets, um, we're looking for things that scale, not tremendously, but, you know, enough to, um, to make some money. Um, of course, anything that's a scam. Competition is one of the key things we look at, um, is the room in the market. And how many of you have um, heard about the Blue Ocean Strategy or, or read the book? Um, again, it's the blue ocean strategy, do we have a red ocean or a blue one? The red ocean is filled with competitors, you know, sharks in the water, <laughs> blood in the water. This analogy is like, oh. And the blue ocean is clear, blue, no, com no competition. Somebody who's really thought of something that there's no competition. A good example is Cirque du Soleil. So if you read the, the blue ocean strategy, the involvement of Cirque du Soleil is a story in there that's just fascinating. I don't have time to go into it today, but it's a, it's a great um, example. So intellectual property, um, kind of need to know um, if they have a patent, but not all, not all startups need a patent. It's okay, not to, um, and can, can it be a strong defense? Is it kind of easy to work around? The team, to me is the most important factor. Um, if, and I go by gut feel so much. And, you know, if I'm talking to a founder or two co-founders, I just can kind of sense, you know, credibility, you know, are, are they really have the, <laughs> the guts to, to make it happen? Um, so again, because of the lean startup concept of, you know, just going a little bit and then starting over, Often the same team that you look at initially, they're gonna be doing something different because of the iterations, okay? So the team has to be really strong um, and can weather, weather the storms. So here's my, here's my example. I love pandas, you can tell. This is my example of a team. And here they're, they have to help each other. It's like all collaboration, trying to get to the top together. So, Briefly, I'm going to talk about getting money to start. If some, some of you maybe had gone through um, investing and um, gone through the ups and downs, um, but there's these are the ways that startups can get money, and I'll just go through them briefly. Uh, bootstrap, that's using your own money. That's starting out there and using your credit cards, your savings, um, whatever you have. Um, and it means a lot to potential investors if you have done that, if you have put your own money into the startup. Crowdfunding. Um, some of you may have be familiar with crowdfunding. The two top ones are Kickstarter and Indiegogo. It's kind of fun to go on those websites and look at the ideas that are out there. But, but the, um, oh, sorry. Um, but the crowdfunding is you make a video or something talking about your product that you're going to make, but you haven't made it yet. You've got to convince people that they, they're going to pledge money for this before it's done. And it's surprisingly successful. 
So, and then if you pledge the money, guess what? You get the product <laughs> when it's done. Um, it's usually for consumer products. Friends and family is the next level above bootstrapping. And that's when you're going to your uncle or your brother or somebody or a friend who gives you um, money and they are simply investing because they want to help. Um, they know you, um, some know you very well. Very small amounts, usually 5,000 to 10,000. And the valuation estimate of these companies are very, very, they're just starting. So maybe they're worth 500,000 or a million. So that's friends and family. And then angel investing comes after that. And that's the first time that you get investments from kind of what we call disinterested parties. We're not friends and family. Um, we're, you know, the motivation is potential returns, um, certainly, um, and a bit of desire to get involved with the entrepreneur. And so angel investors are advisors for the most part, who really come in and uh, we meet weekly sometimes with the founders. Um, so they usually have an affinity uh, industry that they're in. They can help with contacts or huge and all that. So funding for startups here range about maybe 100,000 to 2 million. And the North Bay Angels is part of a, 12 net, a, a group of 12 angel networks in this area, S Sacramento, Sierra, Harvard alum uh, has an angel group, Berkeley. Um, and so we all pool together very often. And one angel group will, will do part of the funding. And these are all individual investors. Some angel groups have a syndicate, have a huge fund that they disperse. Um, but at North Bay Angels, we, we don't have that. We, all, we need to see a prototype, if possible, and some kind of traction. You know, I mean, if there's revenue coming in, that's a huge, a huge plus. So these are more resources for you. This is the, uh, the Blue Ocean Strategy. It's a great book. Um, a lot of stories in there. Angel Investing, if you want to know more about that by David Rose, it's sort of the classic book out there. Um, and then uh, a local guy named Lance Cottrell, who's on the screening committee with me at North Bay Angels. <laughs> I don't know whether I like the name of his site, but it's Feel the Boot. Okay, so but Lance is terrific, and he has um, very short videos on all kinds of things about startups, all, you know, investing, um, you know, and advice for startups. It's just excellent. So, so it's feeltheboot.com. Um, so now I'm just going to share with you. Um, how much time? So I'm just going to share with you some local startups that went through the process just last year um, with North Bay Angels and made it to where we were presenting to the to the members. Um, the first is um, Filmocracy. Okay, it's a streaming platform providing access to film festivals around the world. It's fascinating. You can go on there and watch all kinds of independent films. And it rewards users who, who leave a, a review. So I can't remember how they were making money, <laughs> but I'm sure. Uh, Roadsider is an app for towing services. Roadsider, obvious partner for them would be the AAA. Um, Paw Space, P-A-W Space. It combines state-of-the-art park with a modern workspace complete with a bar barista and food so you can go to work with your dog anyway so pause space labor voices uh, a platform it provides real-time data and analysis on opaque supply chains things that are happening out there over you know in overseas in asia or whatever and uh, companies like the gap north face and and i think adidas use it to really find out what's going on over there where they were making their products. Western States Fire has developed a firefighting system that is used with helicopters to drop a specialized foam 
for up to 8,200 feet of fire line compared to the 600 to 900 feet that is currently used from the tankers, the air tankers. That's, that's a game changer. That's huge. Um, and Bella Snow is a, <laughs> are you ready for this? Bella Snow, it's the name of their dog is Bella. It's a low alcohol, low calorie, gluten removed, zero sugar beer <laughs> with zero flavor. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's lots of flavor. It's, it's not bad. You know, it's actually pretty good. So, <laughs> so it's a beer for those choosing to take a walk on the lighter side. Um, it's only 2.2% alcohol. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, is it worth it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So my last ones are all women founders. These are all women um, who have amazing startups here, here in the area. NeuroAge Therapeutics, two women, PhDs. Oh, they're unbelievable um, skill level for them. San Francisco-based longevity biotech startup creates drugs to reverse brain aging and treat dementia. And they can actually give you a test and it kind of measures where your brain is on the age trajectory. Um, yes. Uh, neuro age therapeutics. Neuro like, neuro, yeah. Aware Health, called Aware Health, a virtual medical, virtual medical advice to prevent orthopedic surgeries and chronic pain for employees. So employers will bring in Aware Health and it cuts their costs for providing surgeries for their employees. So they get cured, if you will, just by a virtual uh, meeting with the doctor instead of having the surgery. So it's sort of amazing. They've done all kinds of studies on this. Authorable has developed and patented a system for allowing elementary schools to team up and publish books. This is an amazing woman out of Central California, Susie Harder. Um, so the kids get together and actually write, do upload their photos and publish a book. And the goal is to help communities. So the kids are kind of thinking about, you know, how to help. Amazing. Um, and she's in 10 different countries now. Jiminy's, uh, Jiminy's is disrupting the pet industry. Are you ready for this? Well, fighting climate change, which is really important, by making sustainable dog food from insect protein. Okay, well, crickets. So Jiminy's crickets. I tell you. So, but you know, it, they've done all kinds of studies and um, they're trying to help the ecosystem by avoiding meat products for dogs. So that just gives you an example uh, of what's going on. Um, so I'll end my talk. This does end, don't worry. <laughs> um, I'll end my talk with a startup. I'll take some more. Uh, I, re I reviewed this startup two years ago. It's changing the senior care industry. It's not local, but it hopes to come out to California soon. The founder, Paige Wilson, struggled to take care of her ailing mother while she was working full time and raising children. Based on her personal experience, she started Neighbor Force, and that's N-A-B-O-R Force. Her journey went like mine. Large corporation experience and then going over to the dark side, if you will, of the startup world. Her idea of how to solve the senior care problem is a winner. Neighbor Force was born to connect older adults with um, light, who need light support and companionship with people in the community who have a desire to help the aging population and who want extra income. Her company culture combines strong operations experience from her finance background and corporations um, with compassion and community. The neighbors, N-A-B-O-R-S, are contract workers and they're paid an hourly wage, wage, and it's about thirty dollars. Um, this is out in Richmond, Virginia, where she started. So, um, and they are hired usually by the children of the person in a senior living 
um, setting. Neighbors bring companionship, they run errands, they fix things, they take short trips with um, the older person. Um, it's just, it's such an amazing environment. If you go to the website, you'll see lots of photos of um, places they go and everybody's smiling, of course, but it's neighborforce.com. And I'm gonna give just a, share a quote from Paige. After my mother passed away, I came to realize that I was not alone. There are 54 million family, 54 million caregivers just like me out there working full time, raising kids um, and helping their aging parents. The answer was right here in our neighborhoods. We could repurpose empty nesters, retirees and others um, who want, who can, and they can serve as sort of backup sons and daughters, if you will, use that analogy. Um, Paige has faced her share of challenges, especially trying to get outside capital to expand. Um, she was surprised to learn that it is significantly more difficult for female founded companies to raise funds, even though they are more capital efficient, they exit more quickly, and they provide a higher return on investment. There's been several studies done on women-owned startups, and this is it's an amazing finding. But only 2.2% um, of venture capital goes to women-owned companies. But she raised $9 million last year from a VC firm in Palo Alto. So that is a real success story for Paige. It's phenomenal. So with that $9 million, hopefully she'll be coming out to California. So to wrap up, um, I hope you come away thinking that new ideas on how to solve problems can pop up, can pop up anytime, whether you're out driving, whether you're hiking a trail or swimming a lap. Some of you are swimmers out there, I'm sure. And if you jot it down and do some research and share it with a friend, it could become something bigger. I say go for it if you have an idea. Don't, don't wait, but it helps to share, of course, and interview a couple people and see. So when you are about to ask your child or grandchild, so what do you want to be when you grow up? Ask this instead. What problem do you want to solve to help people? So that's it. And I will take questions, no problem. Thank Question. you, Michelle. <laughs> and Judy and I will be passing out the microphones. If you have any questions, just raise your hand and we'll get a microphone over to you. All right, I'll take this first one over here. <laughs> it's actually not a question, but I agree with you wholeheartedly. <laughs> if you have an objective, go for it. <laughs> I was a single mom with two kids whom I adored. And I just, I was determined not to have them grow up. Mm, well, I was determined to have them grow up proud of their mom. And so I went out and um, went for what I wanted and I got it. So I love I it. I recommend it by all means. Yeah, great. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. I was thinking about the innovation, and it seems to me that I'm over here. <laughs> I guess I'm coming from everywhere. Uh, it, it seems to me that a lot of the innovation happens outside of the entrepreneurial process. It's like you don't sit down and think, well, I want to start a business. What will I come up with for that? It's because a lot of these ideas, I think, occur spontaneously like you're driving down the road. And I think a lot of them are problem solving, the idea that mother is the uh, necessity is the mother of invention. I think there's other forms of innovation. I think artists in their creative process, mm -hmm. that's a whole different thing, yes. I think. Um, I sister, agree. My sister-in-law would argue that uh, being an artist is not a good way to, to make a business run. <laughs> uh, it's, it's interesting, though, that some artists are more business-like than others you know, and have made a success. 
um, they, or do you have anything else? I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I was just making the, the point that I think. The good point. The idea of sitting down and thinking, well, I'm going to start a business. Mm -hmm. It usually is the other way around. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, the, uh, there was a, a startup I looked at also who thought, oh, I'm going to have a platform for artists who um, have or tr do training. You know, some artists teach. They teach their skill. And I'll just provide the... Uh, to the platform and then I'll do everything and I'll take in the money for the lessons and all that. And he went out, thank goodness, and interviewed 10 artists. And the artist says, nope, we don't, we don't want this. We want to integrate it into our website, into our experience. We don't want any third party out there. So he, he had to really revamp everything, but you know, all kinds of things happening. Yes. Thank you, Michelle. Very interesting talk with good suggestions. I have a bias. I'm thinking the majority of star startups fail. Do you have any statistics on that? Yes, <laughs> you're right. The majority fail, and it's usually about nine out of 10. Um, and it depends. You know, there's venture groups inside large corporations Dell Computer is an example, and their uh, failure rate is a little less, you know, if it's inside a large corporation because they keep, they have money, they keep pouring money in, but they still fail. So it's, it's very difficult. Um, yes, good question. I, I should have brought that up. Yeah, Linda. Yes. Of oh, the microphone. Oh, sorry. What well, just one? Michelle, thank you very much yeah. for a really exciting. Makes me want to go out and do something. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering when you had your tri double triangle up there, and then in the other talks, there's something that I feel that you left out, and I, I imagine you do take it into account when you're judging whether you want to get involved, and that is motive. Does it make a difference to you what your how you assess the motive of the main entrepreneur? I mean, there can be greed, there can be altruism, yeah. there can be it, yes. Thank you. And how um, you judge motive them? is so important. But actually, I did comment though about I really don't take a look at frivolous startups, ones that you know the motive is total greed and all that. I'm not interest, interested in that. But um, the the motive, of course, is the the passion, the credibility, and all that of the founder. Um, and I always look for people that are trying to help, trying to help the world. There's a lot of things out there, a lot of categories you can help with. So, so good point. Yeah. Um, thank you for your talk. I've enjoyed it very mm -hmm. much. Here in Oakmont, we have a wonderful group called Rainbow Women. And they've taken what Paige Wilson did with neighbor helping neighbor and so they have what they do is uh, when somebody is going to have surgery so um, they can contact a member of our group and then we help them through the process yes. with one another and um, I've been fortunate to be a recipient as well as to help and then in Oakmont we also have another program I'm not I believe it was probably started by OVA, where people get rides to their doctor's mm -hmm. appointments. So th it's wonderful, and it really does help people, especially those of us, or not myself yet, but at some point, we may not be able to drive anymore. Right, right. Cooperative effort yes. all around, yes. Thank you, Michelle. Um, yeah. My question is, um, I've often thought of entre intrapreneurship. In other words, uh, inside an organization, mm -hmm. and like let's say a school system, which can be very traditional, and somebody wants to start up a new charter school. And it's like an innovation, but it's within the system and you have to negotiate it within the system. Right. But after what you were saying, I wonder if we do need a, if we knew, need a new term at all, or maybe the current term of entrepreneurship yeah. works. Uh, well, well, thank you, Linda. But actually, intrapreneurship is the term that's used. I should have brought it up. I, I just thought I've got too much to cover, but 
entrepreneurship is alive and well. And um, but there, it, it's still good to bring in an outside design firm like an IDO or, or a, a firm that can just sort of shake things up a little bit. But certainly, entrepreneurship is alive and well. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Why do you think so many venture capitalists support men rather than women? You said only 2% of yeah. women. Um, it's because they're mostly men. <laughs> Pretty easy, yeah. Um, I think uh, it's just sort of amazing. that It's changing a little bit, but it's really been slow. It's really been slow to change. There's been a couple of women who have done have, have lawsuits in Silicon Valley about discrimination. Um, some of them are pretty high visibility, huge VC firms that have um, been taken to task. But that's, <laughs> yes. Oh. I was told somebody else is first. I wanted to know if one is interested in furthering an idea. If you had an idea, where would you where, where would you go with it? Um, I would go to a nonprofit here in Sonoma County called SCORE, S C O R E dot org. They are it's all free service. They are tremendous mentors, um, and there's different categories. If you have an idea in the retail area or in um, environmentalism. It's, it's just phenomenal. And also the small business um, forum, the small, small uh, Sonoma Economic Development Forum is excellent. Um, and I, I, I could have brought a list of those websites, but um, email me, please. And I can, I can do that for you. Yeah, SCORE is, is one of the big ones. They're, they're all over California. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, just revisiting success and failure, that seems tricky because um, person A may hit that first setback on the mm -hmm. graph and go, well, mm -hmm. I failed. Person, person B may go, well, that's just a setback. That's not failure. So mm -hmm. now, so it's, in thinking about that, it seems important to define maybe up front if I'm going to launch something what is what does success and failure even mean how do I know when I'm at those points right exactly and I don't even like to use the term failure I don't blame you um it, in the lean startup concept it's just changing doing something different you're going to find out something somebody's not going to like it it's not going to work with the materials you're using and it's not it's a learning process you're just learning you know, okay, I won't use that. I won't use that material. I'll try something else. So failure is really something um, I don't like to use that term so much. It's just progress. It's, you know, going up and down, but you're learning all the time and you're progressing, even though it's like this, but you're sort of like this. Yes. Any other questions for Michelle? <laughs> We want to thank Michelle for coming in for this great presentation today. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, thank you. We yeah, want to invite right. you back for uh, our next symposium on January 6th. Judy, do you have something you want to add? Anything there? We, I'll tell you this. We have a great, great season coming up. We can't wait to see you. And we all at some Sunday Symposium wish you all Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. Stay safe. Have fun. We'll see you in January. <laughs>